first, good morning everybody, and uh, I would uh, first like to thank uh, the committee for inviting me to this, uh, this conference. Um, I would like also to uh, thank everybody at uh, EGM uh, for hosting me and uh, really uh, welcoming me and, and uh, giving me an opportunity to know a bit about this region of the world and this country in particular. Uh, and interact with faculty members, producers. It's been a, a really very, very interesting experience, um, and I, I'm very grateful uh, for uh, for the invitation and for the the, the welcoming that I had. Um, I also would like to um, to say that it's really an honor to to, to start this conference uh, with this keynote, um, and I think the topic that I'm uh, talking about today. It's, it links very well to what we heard about early in the morning, sustainability to the need to uh, change uh, the way that we produce, to make sure that what we produce and what we consume is more sustainable. In the end of the day, this is our world. Um, we live in the same planet. We need to take care of it, uh, but at the same time, we need to make sure that uh, uh, we have uh, enough for us to, as human beings, to, to, to survive as a, as a society. So I think that's that's um, that's really a, a good point to start. So what I'm going to talk about uh, it's uh, it's about uh, um, standards, food standards, and how do they relate to sustainability and to um, to, uh, to trade. So let me start uh, with some motivation. So what are food standards and, 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 and uh, why are they important for trade? Um, we need to, to kind of take a bit uh, of a step back and understand where are these things coming from. Uh, the first thing that we need to be aware of is, is that trade over the world has increased tremendously over the 30 years and the last 30 years and there's a reason for that. And the reason is that we, in back in 94, when, when I was just about graduating, um, we finalized uh, the, the, the Uruguay round uh, uh, of the, the general agreement on tariffs and trade. What that meant is that uh, uh, from then on, all the countries in the world that signed to, uh, to the, the WTO agreed that they would reduce tariffs uh, that were preventing trade between nations. They didn't brought all these tariffs to zero, but they reduced them significantly. And this really opened uh, the doors to more trade between nations. Well, trade uh, is, 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 for a lot of reasons, a good idea. Uh, it allows nations to have access to products that are not produced on those countries. It allows countries to specialize in, in, certain, in certain productions on which they can be more efficient. Uh, but also trade has, has uh, negative implications. And uh, some of these implications are that they may, may lead to transmission of diseases, plant diseases, and sometimes also human diseases and animal diseases across countries. They might lead to, uh, to invasive species that might destroy local habitats. Um, and and, and that, so they, they, they have uh, uh, some, some, some negative implications. So what happened in the last uh, 30 years? is that, however, while there's been an increase in trade in between nations, um, there's been a, a change of, of the barriers to trade from uh, economical barriers, like tariff at the end, at the end of the border, to non-tariff-based uh, barriers. And some of these are barriers that come through standards. And by a standard, what I mean is, 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 is some sort of a regulation that benefits uh, the producers of a certain country uh, on behalf of, of producers coming to that country. And these barriers can be um, linked to, to, to food safety or to animal uh, uh, um, preservation or whatever dimension. And, and so, so there's this idea that uh, particularly public and, and official regulations might prevent trade. Um, and so this is one of the, 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 the problems that we're facing. But there are, however, um, we need to, to realize that firms and consumers expect more and more variety. Consumers also are starting to increasingly be aware of the consequences of their consumption 
uh, across the world um, and in, in climate change. And so there is, at the, at, at the same time as that there, are, there emerge uh, private uh, public standards, there are also emerging private standards, voluntary standards that producers may or not uh, would be willing to adopt. And these standards are associated to high value products. Um, it's a way that firms use to differentiate their products. And, and these standards, uh, because they are voluntary, they might force the trade with, without actually having all the negative effects. So there's an opportunity to use these voluntary private standards, and they are private because they often emerge from the private sector, being a retailer or an NGO. I'll, I'll, I'll give you some examples of that. Uh, they can actually can use you can use it to, to a bit of, of two, two advantages. One, they, they, they increase wealth by, through the, the, the benefits of trade, so they, they, they can link consumers um, with producers in, in different areas. But because these standards might lead to restrictions on certain ways to produce, um, they actually might contribute to sustainability as well. So, uh, uh, so that's what, sort of what I, I wanted to reflect a bit about today. Um, and, uh, and, and, and just to, to give you an example of what I'm talking about, um, we, you might know uh, these symbols. These are the symbols for organic uh, uh, farming uh, in the US and in Europe. There are equivalent symbols for uh, different countries, for Indonesia as well. Uh, what this is, this is not a private standard, this is a public standard, but it's a voluntary standard. So producers that want to uh, sell their product as organic product, they need to follow certain rules. And these rules are actually the standard. Uh, it turns out that this standard is regulated by nations, but not all the producers in that country need to apply by this standard. So that's an example of what I'm talking about, a private standard. Um, it, people, farmers might want or not want to adopt it. But there are other types of standards that are truly private, and these, the, the ones on the left, on, on, on your left here, are standards set up by uh, retailers, in, initially at least, and the one on top is the, the British Retail Consortium standard. And these are good agricultural practices standards, but also good, practic uh, good production and manufacturing, manufacturing practices. So they will require certain um, activities, either at the farm level or in the production facility, so that the product has a certain type of characteristics. These standards uh, that I'm showing you here are not visible to the consumer. They are business-to-business -business standards. So they are used to regulate supply chains. And then we have other types of private voluntary standards, like fair trade, um, that is a standard that emerged to assure that uh, smallholder farmers across the world producing different types of commodities uh, have a decent living. And so this standard guarantees a certain price, uh, but also it supports the communities with all sorts of activities. And it's recognized increasingly by, by consumers uh, in the States uh, and in Europe, different countries, uh, and, and these consumers are prepared to pay an extra price for, uh, uh, for um, the, the service that they think they are providing to, uh, to, to, to the producers uh, from which they are buying the product for. Uh, other types of standards that are private uh, are the, uh, the certified sustainable seed food uh, standard. These are uh, standards that define how certain uh, fisheries operate. Uh, and again, they will require fishermen to adopt certain practices. Um, another uh, type of standard of this sort, and that also emerges from an NGO, is the, the rainforest uh, certification. This is a, an environmental standard uh, that is used on several tropical uh, uh, products, as you know. And the related one is UTS, uh, which is a standard for uh, tea, coffee, cocoa, and hazelnut that emerged from a, a, a group of, uh, of uh, buyers uh, of coffee in, in Germany and, uh, and the Netherlands. Interestingly, uh, as I will, I will tell you, uh, some of these standards are, are, are similar, they compete somehow as well, but what is interesting to see now is how do these standards uh, 
continue to the future. And uh, one recent uh, 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 development is that, uh, uh, for instance, uh, two of these standards just merged. So actually the Woods and the Rainforest uh, uh, Standard uh, organizations agreed that these standards had enough in common that uh, they were imposing an extra burden to producers that were uh, adopting each of these standards, and so they decided to merge. And now, uh, UTS is going to disappear by the end of this year, and they, it's, the, 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 it's going to be sort of replaced. All that their producers will be become Rainforest Alliance uh, uh, certified. So, so that's an example of, of, of what this is. This is uh, this is happening now. What I think I wanted to kind of give you a clear idea about is that at the moment, these standards um, only represent a small portion of all the production uh, in different products uh, in the world. Uh, but they show you and pave the way to a world of possibility in terms of a, a more production, a more integrated uh, uh, food system that integrates the demand of consumers that are worried about uh, the impact of their consumption uh, in the world and producers that are trying to get a better living. So I think there's an opportunity in here, but there's a lot of work to be done. Um, so what I wanted to really kind of talk about is, is to kind of reflect a bit with you uh, on uh, how do these quality standards uh, are facilitating or, or, or uh, affecting trade. I was telling you the story that in the end of the day, it was the GT, the, 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 the the WTO with the abolition of, of, of tariffs that kind of led a vacuum uh, and this led to the emergence of, of some standards to guarantee that the, the, the trade is, is still safe. Um, these standards, I think, have the advantage of, because they are voluntary and that because they are driven by the private sector and they apply to both producers uh, in the countries where these, these standards originate and overseas, I think they have an advantage regarding uh, public standards. So it's my belief that actually they facilitate trade rather than, than, uh, than, uh, than affecting trade. But we, we need to investigate this further. And there are some studies that have been done already uh, that, that are starting to, to kind of provide evidence for this. And then uh, I think what is also important is to understand to what extent these private standards and how can these private standards uh, improve uh, uh, um, Trade. Oh, sorry, it's sustainability. And then, what are the opportunities and challenges that are emerging in this space? Um, so I'll skip this. So uh, just to kind of go back a bit, what are these standards? So these are really norms, norms of production, norms of, of, of manufacturing um, that uh, uh, you know define and 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 and, uh, and oblige the producers to follow a certain type of of of. Uh, of um, of way of producing uh, uh, their products. And so uh, they've been developed uh, in a way to manage risks in supply, to make sure that the, 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 my buyers or my, my, my sellers are doing what I expect them to do. So uh, that facilitates procurement. Also, it homogenizes uh, the, the, the product. It, it, they are used to support brands uh, and, and logos. And they are also uh, a means to improve consumer trust. Uh, so really, what these standards also do from an economics perspective is that they reduce information asymmetries. And by information asymmetries, I mean that often in a supply uh, relationship, the, the seller of the product might not, might not, might normally knows more about the product than the buyer. And so, by imposing a standard, the buyer can say, "Okay, uh, if you're going to produce, I'm only going to trust you if you produce it." produce the product this way, because producing this way will allow me to assure that uh, I can trust the product it will give me. Um, so that's one of the advantages. Uh, and then also uh, what it does is, is, um, is, is they impose certain practices that uh, reduce risks uh, of different things. So that's really uh, 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 what they are about. But for them to work, they really require trust. Trust on the buyer, trust on the seller, trust on the consumer. And so, for that, there needs to be compliance, there needs to be monitoring of whether producers are following the standard or no. And so, that's the critical issue uh, uh, that, that is involving here. Um, so, what is 
becoming uh, uh, increasingly true in, in food markets, is that the value of products in the consumer comes from, from some certain attributes that consumer values. And what happened in the last 30 years is that most of these attributes are not verifiable by the consumer. So 30 years ago, people will distinguish between different foods by their color, by their, their taste, and you can verify that. But when we, we start uh, differentiating products based on organic or not organic, um, from, Indonesia, from a certain island in Indonesia or another island, uh, it's, the consumer cannot, there's no way that the consumer can, can, can verify that. And so these attributes become credence attributes because they're not verifiable by the consumer. So when we, we trading on credence attributes, um, we are really trading on trust. And so we really need to build this trust with consumers. And that's one of the fundamental uh, roles of, of these standards. So we really need to uh, uh, gain and maintain reputation. Because if we, if this loss, if we lose these costs, then the market will fail. So that's one of the really critical issues that is going on here. Uh, so suppliers need to deliver the attributes that consumers expect. And, 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 and we do need to demonstrate that. And that's the, the role of the standard, really. Uh, so these are some of the aspects that uh, uh, consumers are, are, are wanting. They, they, they are wanting uh, healthiness, and that comes from a certain nutritional characteristic of food. They are wanting uh, uh, a better uh, consideration for the environment when on the production. Uh, consumers in, in the West are increasingly uh, aware of, of, of the impacts on, on, on animal welfare. And so that actually is leading sometimes to total uh, 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 elimination of meat consumption, which is a problem to some countries. Um, and, uh, and they are starting, there's a group of consumers at least, that uh, we call ethical consumers. And they, they, when they consume, they want to make sure that their consumption um, has a positive impact. They're not only worried about satisfying their own needs, but through their consumption, satisfying the needs of other people. And so that's that's something that uh, that is uh, is important. So there's an opportunity really in here to link uh, the needs of consumers with the needs of of uh, of, uh, of the, the, the the producers, and, and and the standards can be the vehicle through which, through which you can you can do this. So now talking a bit about the impact of these uh, standards that I was talking to you about uh, on trade, uh, what it's very clear is that, uh, especially in the last 15 years, all these private standards have emerged that have been adopted by big supply chains, uh, manufacturers, Unilevers, and Nestle's of this world, but also the major supermarkets uh, in the US and, uh, and in, in Europe. And we need to recognize that, for instance, in the UK, the leading supermarkets, the leading three supermarkets, uh, account for about 70% of, of, of food purchased by consumers. So it's a very significant amount of food that is sold through supermarkets. I know that in this area of the world it might be different, but they have an enormous power and enormous influence on the consumers. But also they need to respond to what the consumers want. Um, so these, the, because now these, 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 these uh, businesses are sourcing from all over the world uh, and they are imposing standards uh, for, for, for their buyers, uh, this is in a way, they, this is increasing trade because it's facilitating more farmers to, to, to access these value supply chains. So that, there is some evidence that uh, the number of, of farmers um, and the volume of, of product that is sold through these standards is increasing and that is suggesting that, that that will have a positive trade effect. Um, but not all, not all standards will have the, the same impact. So some will have more impact than others, and that's what we still need to investigate a lot more. Um, but that, I'll give you just some figures uh, there. Um, the sales of, say, fair trade increase, are increasing at about an average of 6% a year, uh, and they reached last year uh, about uh, uh, um, uh, 6.6 billion dollars. Now this is just 5% of, 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 of the total trade on or the total consumption of the products that are on fair trade. But you know it's it, it's it's growing faster than the other types of non-conventional or, or non uh, um, 
non-ethical types of, of, of products. Um, the same goes with, with organic uh, sales, still increasing. Um, and uh, unfortunately for Global, Global Gap and uh, the British retail consortium, there's not a lot of data. This, these are private companies and they are are less transparent than, than some of these other um, standards that are managed by, by NGOs. Um, so that's a bit more secluded, but, but if you kind of look into their website and you look at the number of farmers adopting these standards, I think there are some suggestions that they are also growing. Um, but a concern that we'll have, and that and this will impact on trade, is that in the end of the day, um, the ethical consumer is typically a more educated consumer, a higher income consumer, and, uh, and because currently the incomes in the West, uh, especially the, the, the middle classes, are stagnant, there are some concerns whether uh, we are kind of reaching a ceiling on the expansion of these, these types of products. So that's something that we need to be careful about and keep a look at. Uh, and this is just a, 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 some, some data on global organic sales. It doesn't really reflect trade, but uh, it allows you to see allows you to see two things. The first thing is that uh, I don't know if you can see it, but the proportion of, of uh, can I find this? Anyway, no, it doesn't seem that I can point. Uh, but if you look at the proportion of, uh, uh, of organic, it's just that tiny strip of blue on top of the, the, the graph. So it's, uh, it's the amount of sales from organic compared to um, the whole uh, 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 product category of packaged foods is really, really small. But if you look at the gross per year, it's, it, it's, it's quite remarkable. So uh, again, not a, a huge amount, but, uh, but increasing very fast. Um, now, talked about impact on trade, but I think also it's important to understand what is the impact on sustainability. And when we talk about sustainability, we need to, to think of how do we, what is sustainability? What are we talking about? A lot of people, uh, when they talk about sustainability, they, they think about uh, preservation of the environment, and that's certainly a dimension, but also it's this idea that we will able, be able to feed current and future populations. That's the really idea. So one of the critical things is to make sure that we assure that our resources are preserved for the future. So in that sense, these standards can potentially... What is this? What? Thank you. Ah, this is the point. No, doesn't matter. I can work with this one. Um, so these standards, to the extent that they can include rules that are consistent with the preservation of resources, they can help sustainability. And one of the advantages also of these private standards is that it's a lot easier for the private sector to change a standard than it is for a, 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 a public agency to, stand, to, 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 to change a standard. So if you want to, if you have a regulation, national regulation, you want to change it, you, go, you need to go to parliament, you need to go to all sorts of committees, which makes this very slow, whereas uh, these private standards are much faster on that. So uh, what also is interesting is that these organizations that are adopting these standards uh, are increasingly aligning with the, the, the new development goals. And so these standards actually have the possibility of delivering a much more sustainable uh, production. And I think that's one thing that uh, we, we need to, 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 to look into. So there is some evidence that, uh, that these standards are actually working. So some evidence uh, first on, 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 the, on the private standards and in terms of trade. Uh, and this is a study that uh, was just presented last, uh, last September in the European Association of Agricultural Economics, a paper by Anderson that shows that global gap, one of the standards I talked about, does increase market access, so it seems to have a positive impact on trade. But also, uh, a, a very interesting study uh, conducted by Martins uh, et al. Uh, that looks at the impact of, of, of a number of standards on, uh, on, um, on social, economic, and environmental impact. And, and uh, I'll show you, sorry, I'll just uh, skip this. this. I was just showing you which areas of the, the environmental goals are the standards um, uh, applying. Uh, and this would be on responsible, con responsible consumption and production, on climate change, and uh, also on these partnerships uh, for, uh, for future uh, goals. I think these standards are really doing that. 
but uh, what I really wanted uh, to, um, to show you is this results of this very interesting paper by Martin Zettel that uh, shows very interesting things. So not all these standards are equal in terms of their impact. So what she did, she, did is she compared two groups of standards. She compared the, uh, the fair trade and organic standards to the uh, uh, Rainforest Alliance, the 4C, which is a coffee standard, and, uh, and the woods uh, in, in, a, in a region of Uganda. And uh, what she finds is, is quite remarkable, uh, is that there is a trade-off, apparently, uh, between the environmental impact and the social economic impact of application of these standards. So some of these standards perform very well in terms of protection of the environment, but they don't, they don't perform so well in terms of social economic impact. Meaning that, and this is the example of, of this, this, uh, this graph on, on your right, um, that, uh, that shows that uh, uh, the, the, food, the, the, the FT, which is the fair trade and the organic standard, actually leads to a, a lower a lower yield and therefore a lower income to the farmers than uh, the youths and, and, and the rainforest that apparently are a little bit um, less restrictive uh, in terms of, of, uh, of uh, inputs that, 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 um, that can be used. But then when you look at the environmental impact, uh, well, um, and, and there's different types of, and this is again something that we need to debate. What, when you talk about environmental impact, what are we talking about? Uh, in this case, we're talking about carbon storage, uh, tree density, um, um, entomology, uh, so insect flora, um, and, 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 uh, and quantity. And, and, and you can see that actually the picture is, is, is not so clear. So actually, in this case, the organic and the fair trade perform better than the other ones. So what I think this is suggesting to me is that first, we need to understand that there might be some conflicts in the application of these standards but also that these private standards uh, might need some reconciliation. They might need to come together uh, to really have an impact. And also what this suggests to me is that we need to be a, bet, a lot better in measuring the impact of these standards uh, in, in the ground, in the field. And, and that's a really challenge for all of us in here. Uh, um, that can be, I think it's worth stressing. Um, just very quickly, uh, what are the opportunities that I think that exist? And I'm, I know that I'm a bit uh, 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 above my time limit, uh, but very quickly. So voluntary standards, uh, I think they can drive change, and specifically they, they can drive uh, uh, um, uh, sustainability uh, if they are well designed, and, and they have the opportunity to be that. Uh, I think they, they, they also, uh, they are a way to, to, to justify premium in, 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 in high value markets. They can link consumers uh, in the developed world with producers uh, in the developing world, and so create multiple balances. I think technology and IT technology can, can facilitate that as well. Um, and, uh, and they also, they can, because they have this flexibility of being updated regularly, they can align nicely with, with the 2030 development goals. And so I think there's really opportunity to use, to in, include the private sector on this mission to, 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 to have a more a sustainable uh, food sector. Uh, but there are challenges. One of the main challenges is monitoring, the cost of monitoring and, and, and enforcement of these standards. That's a challenge. Uh, how do we how do we actually define better measures to, to, to measure the impact of this? So otherwise we, we might be kind of fooling ourselves. Uh, we need to understand how can we expand the market for these standards, particularly in the developing world. So this is a big challenge. And then of course there's a challenge of education of producers um, that we need to overcome. Um, so. These are some of uh, the ideas uh, that uh, I think we can debate uh, in, in the next uh, 20 minutes. So just to summarize, so private standards are standards that are emanating and emerging from the, the, the private sector to initially to govern their supply chains, but increasingly to demonstrate to consumers that uh, the premiums that they pay are justifiable. Um, they, they are there to secure certain, secure certain attributes uh, are, are present. Um, they are mainly kind of driven by manufacturers and, and retailers in the, in, the, in, the EU, in the European US, but increasingly they are being adopted and developed in other parts of the world. And uh, um, they are really starting to, to, to have a positive impact, both on trade and sustainability. But there are still a lot of uh, questions that uh, 
we, we can address and should address in the future. So um, I'm grateful for your time. Uh, and uh, if you have any questions, I'm more than welcome uh, to entertain. And uh, if you want to contact me, this is me. Thank you.